Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Claire, and I am uh, the Senior National Representative of Luxembourg at the CCDCOE, where I am in the strategy branch. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today to this final panel session of day two of SICON, peering past NATO's precinct. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we start. Uh, this meeting is not live streamed, but it is being recorded. You may wish to bear that in mind when you intervene. Um, uh, also, if you do intervene and take the floor, we would be grateful if you could state your name and your affiliation. So, NATO established with the 1949 North Atlantic Treaty. There was a very clear delineation of scope to the territories of the Allies and their assets in Europe, north of the Tropic of Cancer. That sounds rather quaint today, that there is such clear geographical delineation, but that was the case in 1949. 74 years later, we have progressed somewhat to 360 degree deterrence. That means security from all threats in all directions, safeguarding freedom, promoting stability and well-being, and tackling and mitigating crisis and conflict. We've seen this shift in part due to increasing connectivity, a phenomenon which actually started in the military world, and then the civilian world took the reins and ran with it. And the civilian sector is indeed where most of the innovation regarding interconnectivity is taking place. Our hearts and minds are inextricably linked with the opportunities and the challenges provided by increased economic activity, aided by interconnectivity, they're swayed by the consequences of the struggle between globalization and strategic autonomy. They're affected by the fluctuations and also the sea changes in geopolitical poles and world order. All of this affects our liberal democratic values and how we shape the future of cyberspace and our societies in that image. In short, there is a lot going on and, and at ever faster pace. So today, where we'll discuss how NATO should face this multipolar world, this world which is underpinned by a myriad of opaque interdependency to tackle crisis and conflict. Today, we have three very qualified and experienced speakers who will, between them, represent the organisation in question and also present the results of their original work. And also, because today, here, is the last panel of today, You've been exposed to a lot of exciting ideas and innovative concepts, so there is also a role for you, the audience, so that we can gain the fruits of your existing experience and um, knowledge, and also what you have been hearing the last two days. Therefore, you will find some things on your chair that will enable some audience participation, and that's what we're going to start with, and that's what we're going to end with. So we will start with some icebreakers. You will hear the panel, we will give you a couple of minutes to consider the question on your, t on your chairs. We will discuss that, and at the end, we will also get you to write the take-home message. So if we could start with the first slide. It's going to come up. Right, so who here is from a... You have the three colours on your chairs. Pick the one which is relevant to you or your organisation that you represent, or the one you identify most with. So if you wouldn't mind putting your hands up now, we can have a good idea of who in the room we have. So not that surprising that we have most people in the room coming from an <laughs> EU or NATO member state. We have one person from the global, two people from the global south, possibly one person from the global south, and anybody who comes from something they would like to call other. OK. <laughs> so, four others, one Global South, notwithstanding one of our panellists. Thank you. So, let's see. What we're going to start off with is a Mentimeter, where if you wouldn't mind using your devices to put in the following code, we're going to see what you say before you hear our panellists speak. If you could suggest one area NATO should focus more on, what would it be? Gentlemen? We're going to now put up the results so you can have, have a look. Oh. You can put more than one answer, but we will close it at some point. But right now, only two people have replied, and one of them was mine, which I made <laughs> earlier to test the whole thing worked. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
This is wonderful. We should have this at the North Atlantic Council. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll let you get, I think you must be more than 45. We'll go for 45. <laughs> <laughs> okay. People are liking interoperability in China and partnership with industry. Any more for any more? Great. So our panelists can also see what you're writing, so you should give them some food for thought for our later discussions. And we will, uh, we will take a screenshot of this. So thank you for your participation here, and I'm going to move on to introducing our very first speaker. So our first speaker, we're very lucky, we have, he has an extremely long history of working in defence matters. He is from the home nation here. He has worked as advisor to the Minister of Defence of Estonia. He has been defence councillor at the Estonian delegation to the NATO. And he has also been defence councillor at the Estonian embassy to the US in Washington. We're very lucky to have him because he is one of the founding fathers of the CCD COE. And he was also one of the geniuses behind the conception of this conference back in the day. He is currently head of the cyber, <laughs> oh, head of the cyber policy and hybrid policy section at NATO on the international staff. It is my great pleasure to welcome to you, Christian Mark Liflander. Slightly embarrassed now, but I'll do my best. Um, good afternoon and, uh, and welcome. I mean, the, the few and the brave uh, that have sort of stuck with us uh, this last panel. So let's, let's try to um, make it useful. Um, so today I want to talk to you about three things. First, on peace. Uh, second, onions. And last, about competition. Um, so let me explain myself. Um, when, I, when I heard the call and when I sort of started to prepare my remarks, um, I got to thinking about the future. In other words, what does this sort of landscape look like uh, where we um, not only are situated in right now, but what is it that we have to face in the future? And of course, for those of you that are avid NATO watchers, uh, the current Bible is the strategic concept that was approved by allies at the Madrid summit. Now, if you read it, and I think you will find two interesting facts. Um, first, use of force has not disappeared from international relations. And um, President Putin's uh, war in Ukraine is a proof of that. So this one core mission that NATO has historically had, still has the, the big DND, as we refer to it, defense and deterrence, is still very much part of the landscape, deterring bad things from happening and defending allied territories if need be. But there's also something more sinister to it when you look at it. Um, it appears that um, many malicious actors have become quite clever when it comes to operating below the threshold of the use of force. In other words, tailoring their activities um, so as to not to cross the threshold that would actually get them to, uh, to the category of the use of force. So, in essence, what you're looking at, I think, is no, no, no longer something that can be described as, as peace, crisis and conflict. But I think the, a much better way to, to come to grips with the re reality of today is to talk about competition, crisis and conflict. Um, and the reason I titled this first segment as on peace is that a good friend of mine, uh, Lucas Kello in Oxford, keeps referring to that as on peace. It's no longer this sort of dichotomy between war and peace. Uh, it is permanently contested. Um, what's more, I think when we at least look ahead um, over the next decade as to sort of what is to come, I think quite a lot of that, um, quite a lot of that competition will focus on technology uh, in its different shapes, in its different forms. Um, but what we don't have the luxury of is not to compete. We are part of that competition. I think the biggest question is how do we want to compete? Which brings me um, to the second question about the onions. And uh, here I'm referring to what I would call a strategic onion. Um, and if sort of the prerogative here is to compete, the question is how to compete, I think that competition will take many forms. Um, some of that competition, quite a lot of it actually, is derived from the choices and decisions made by nations themselves. It starts at home. 
Um, to be very honest, I don't really think that we have fully embraced the mentality and the sort of the, the thinking of uh, of competition. And let me give you perhaps a, sort of a one specific example. I mean, quite often when I get to talk to intelligence agencies, but also industry, um, it's the privacy issues that trump the day. Quite often, IP addresses are sort of treated as a private um, uh, information. In other words, um, it's sort of erring on the side of an individual and on the side of the, of, the, of the privacy, which I think sort of gives you a lopsided view and sort of uh, makes things slow and not as agile if you want to be part of that competition. So I think we, at least in the democratic societies, we need to kind of get to a good balance between the private good and the collective good so as to sort of be part of that competition. So legislation is going to be important and the national action in this regard. But there's also, of course, the sort of the bilateral measures and the multilateral measures. And here, I think you have a whole constellation of different actors. And coming to NATO, uh, we are but one of these actors, of course. So you have um, EU that primarily looks at the market regulation, increasingly now also the cyber defense matters. You have UN trying to craft the international law, you know, rules of the road when it comes to the open-ended working group. OSCE with the CVMs, confidence building measures, you have ITU with technical standards, etc. And I think NATO's sort of competitive advantage, if I may say so, here is the security and defense. That's the view that we have had, and I think that's the view that we will continue to have. Which brings me to my, to my third point, and that's how to compete. And I think NATO's role has always been uh, that of sort of helping allies to compete after all when it comes to force posture and also um, sort of everything that uh, is called usually NATO. I mean, NATO itself doesn't have tanks or planes or ships. These all belong to allies. Similarly, I think the question here is how to enable allies to compete in that space better. Uh, how to be that connecting tissue. I think we have a good track record when it comes to different uh, specific initiatives that we have launched. Um, we have the malware information sharing platform. We have Diana, as you heard. Um, we are sort of politically signaling um, sort of what's okay and what's not okay in response to sort of uh, malicious activities that have taken place. Um, but I think that strategic competition will take many forms. So if I can leave you with, with some free departing thoughts, I don't think that we can actually sort of patch ourselves out of that situation. I don't think that a reactive posture uh, is going to make it. So we need to think about how to proactively shape the space at the technical level, at the military level, but also at the political level. Second, it is about values. At the end of the day, that technology will reflect the kinds of the values that we project into it. If we don't do it, somebody else is going to do it for us. Um, so proactive uh, shaping, and it's about values. And last but not least, I think it's also challenging the very notion and the, well, we're very sort of understanding how we have dealt with cyber. What is cyber? What does it mean? Props to Clint Watson, to Microsoft that are talking, and also to Palo Alto that are talking about sort of the broader understanding of innovation and the broader understanding of cyber, perhaps the cognitive aspects of it as well, certainly when it comes to sort of the whole spectrum activities that we're seeing. Um, so that's why I think there's something greater afoot and we need to lift our gaze. With that, Claire, back to you. Thank you. What we're going to do today is we're going to have the three speakers one after the other, and then we will have questions and a bit of audience participation and then more discussion. So our next speaker. Our next speaker is a representative from the Global South. He is from Brazil. He has had the exciting and I would say unenviable opportunity to work in risk and threat assessment during mega events, notably the 2014 World Cup and the 2016 Olympics. That's no small uh, event organization there. He has a master's uh, in research, and he also, uh, sorry, in international relations, and he's a Chevening alumnus with a master's in international peace and security. He's working at the intersection of international law, international peace and security, and cybersecurity. And he's currently a conf cyber conflict and international law professor at the Brazilian Research Institute. He's here to talk to us today about his research regarding EU-NATO engagement with the Global South and what we can do about it. So, Eduardo, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Let me just... Oh. Hello. Just... Well, 
first of all, I would like to thank uh, CCDCOE uh, for inviting me uh, and giving me the opportunity to discuss uh, the Global South perspective. It's a uh, wonderful opportunity to share an uh, uh, issue that I'm passionate about. Usually you hear the, the disclaimer about uh, this is only my personal view and not representative of my organization and so forth. And well, I'm doing the opposite here. Uh, some of the ideas here are mine and some of the others are from my colleagues. So Dr. Van Kirk and Professor Hamlukan are responsible as well for the paper. Uh, the paper gives uh, a focus on Latin America and Africa mainly because I'm from Latin America and they're from, from South Africa, so it provides us with a view, uh, a comprehensive view. Uh, that being said, our exercise also <coughs> suggests that we don't have many people from the Global South, so it's interesting to debunk a first uh, perception regarding the Global South. It's not necessarily on the South. And well, the Global is a nice brand because you kind of encompasses everything. Uh, but here a, is a sort of a long tradition if you think about non-aligned movements and third world countries. So not necessarily we're going to be describing a monolithic identity here. Even amongst uh, global south countries, we have significant differences. And is, after all, a self-attributed uh, characteristic. So you might have you know, different perspectives from neighboring countries. Uh, that consider themselves to be part of the Global South or not. So, those disclaimers uh, in place. So I think the, the driver, the, the question that drove us to, to discuss and write this paper is the idea of, yes, we are in a multipolar world. And it's interesting because if you think about geological eras, usually that transition it doesn't have a precise event. No, it's not like April 3rd, three billion years ago that the Jurassic started or ended at 11 p.m. That doesn't happen in geological terms. But historians, they do. They do choose a particular date, being, for instance, the Westphalian uh, Treaty, one of the, the major examples. It's one of the treaties. It's not just a single one, and we usually refer to it. So here, we usually think uh, the Berlin Wall as being one of the, the landmarks, and now the second Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine, the second one of that, you know, post-Cold War and multipolar reality. And that might give the impression that Africa and Latin America, they are far away from that traditional, you know, geopolitical tectonic fault lines being Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, or if you want to call it, for instance, uh, Middle East as well. So it, it might give us the sense that, well, we are far away from that, so uh, we shouldn't be really uh, concerned. But of course, in a globalized world where you have economics and now cyber, uh, the entanglement is larger. It's hard to to be a Latin American and say, I don't have anything to do with that. Uh, but of course, geography might make you more aware of it. So as close as you are to an issue, of course, that's more salient to you. Uh, and I think both regions and the Global South, it really have uh, you know, a clashing values. Uh, uh, my fellow speaker already talked about values, and I do agree, I think that's the, the point. I think values are the issue here. Uh, on one hand, we have you know, financial trade and economic dependence with uh, China, mostly from, from Latin America and African perspective. Uh, but we do have a rich and cultural uh, history with uh, EU and NATO countries. Not always uh, for the best. Uh, colonialism is still uh, an issue in Africa and Latin America. Uh, and that might be the reason why sometimes EU and NATO might feel, why are you guys on the fence? Yeah, I mean, it's, isn't clear what's going on here? And, and you might think, being a Latin American, I'm going to quote Marx here, not the one that your guys are thinking, but Groucho Marx, you know, the idea of, yes, these are conflicting values. And, and the fact that we have that tough decision where deciding on taking a financial trade economic hit 
for countries that sometimes have you know, basic needs not fulfilled for their population, it's a challenge. So I know it's a challenge for everyone to make a decision based on values, but I'm just putting some context here. Sometimes, you know, 10% increase in fuel for a country, it's a lot of difference if you think about a in Global South perspective. Uh, so I'm not trying to, to say that we're right by, by sitting on the fence. I'm just trying to provide a context on why uh, is that that is happening. I, of course, I want also to point out that, for instance, we're here in Saikon. I'm here from the Global South talking about my perspective, which is interesting. We don't have a Saikon BRICS, for instance. That would be the place where the Global South could be talking about this, and we're not. So uh, kudos for, for the West in that sense, uh, because it's providing an opportunity for transparency and dialogue <coughs> in, instead of a more opaque perspective on cyber uh, offensive capabilities. But talking more about the paper, uh, what did we decide to do thinking about, well, are we as Global South leaning towards China and Russia? And that's one of the questions. We chose to analyze voting patterns at the UN uh, regarding cyber policy issues, so it's not like a huge sample. Nevertheless, it allowed us to make a, an analysis on that. It's not uh, statistically conclusive. Uh, however, uh, it shows some inclination regarding some Russian and Chinese positions, particularly when we have these two issues involved, the idea of inclusive, uh, including uh, more countries to the, the dialogue, which uh, was almost pervasive across the, the Global South as, a, as an interesting uh, topic, and the idea of capacity building. And that's pretty obvious. Global South needs to improve its, uh, its capabilities and knowledge. Uh, I mean, even NATO and EU countries are talking about this right now at the conference. It, it, it makes completely sense that we do the same. So now it's the part, uh, the fun part of being, you know, of academia. Yeah, I can make policy recommendations regardless if they are, you know, challenging or not. <laughs> so we see, uh, and we dive in a bit into the paper. So please feel free to to read it. We have lots of charts and maps to keep you entertained. I'm not going to throw it out away uh, at you right now. But the idea here is thinking about the like-minded countries. We chose two particular uh, you know, activities that like-minded countries usually perform. One of them is information sharing, and the other one much more complex and layered, which is the attribution processes. And we see, at least from you know, open source information that usually the Global South doesn't take part on that. Uh, is it because we're not invited? Is it because we were invited and didn't show up? That is not clear from an academic perspective, but it is a point to observe. I can see clear benefits for the EU and NATO broadening the geographical base of, uh, for instance, a, a in attribution processes, or at least some, some sort of uh, consensus regarding on what activity might be perceived as unacceptable. Uh, it might be easy to convince the Global South that, for instance, uh, cyber criminal activities to support a nuclear program do, uh, uh, do qualify as you know, unacceptable behavior. Maybe meddling in elections as well. So, Maybe we should go for the low-hanging fruits, regardless of we, if we can, we can agree on it was Russia, China, Iran, or so forth. Maybe there are some low-hanging fruits here, and that's what we argue in the paper. And of course, on the other hand, for Africa and Latin America, you can see benefits of information sharing, of knowledge, and eventually raising the bar on cyber defense. We would defend better against those threats that happened against us as well. We are all targets on that. Well, the second point that we work on our paper is the idea of offensive cyber capabilities, which is interesting because it's no longer a taboo. Uh, yesterday, I saw a wonderful presentation from Professor Dwyer talking about you know, the UK cyber responsible uh, power which thinks about the idea of projection, power projection, and eventually deals with the offensive cyber capabilities. It's not only the UK, the US, and other European countries. I think Denmark and Netherlands as well also mention it. So 
This is part of responsible state behavior now. There is a way to deploy offensive cyber capabilities that are uh, responsible. And one of the things that I, we go on the paper on numerous examples of private vendors selling capabilities to Latin American and African countries, and that being deployed in a way that violates human rights and basic freedoms. And many of those companies are operating from Western nations. So this is, as we see it, an opportunity. So uh, there is a way to deploy offensive cyber capabilities in a national security balanced way. Of course there is. Uh, we have issues with organized crime, drug cartels, terrorist organizations we could use against them. But whenever a government crosses the line, uh, should the West and EU and NATO be a bystander? Maybe we can use some help here, and particularly from the perspective of a citizen. So that's the part where I'm finishing. Am I going to say, well, what should we do? So, of course, uh, we should share information. We should try to attribute uh, operations. And that's going to be a challenge for you guys because finding the right stakeholders in the Global South is hard. You know, the ecosystem is quite different from country to country, from region to region. Uh, you will deal with situations where the government is not exactly a democratic one, uh, but it might be useful to reach out. And one of the ideas that we put forward is the idea of a digital ombudsman, the idea of someone uh, uh, neutral from, from uh, uh, countries here in the, in, the, in the West, thinking about receiving this kind of you know, notice, reporting. We see Amnesty International Citizen Lab doing wonderful reports on the abuses by these companies. And it's not reasonable to think that this market is going to close. I'm not suggesting that you should shut the market. Many of the people that work on those companies maybe attended Cycon at some point in their career. So it's, it's, not a, it's not absurd to exist. It's just a matter of creating some values-based uh, exports. And here, the digital ombudsman would be a nice alternative, precisely because in the Global South, sometimes you cannot go to a, you know, the judiciary, local judiciary, because it's quite frankly not independent. It's not rule of law strong enough. So this would be an alternative. And final thoughts, the idea of a template for other fields. Maybe in the future we can cooperate on data protection, AI, and so forth, based on this kind of approach. So with that in mind, I'm going to leave it there. Oh, yes, my contacts, please. Uh, uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Oh. Sorry. Thank you, Eduardo. That was very insightful and a definitely a different perspective from the ones we're used to here. Our final speaker is from the US. He has the Master's in, in International Relations from Yale, and he is currently Head of Strategic Cyber Threat Intelligence at Booz Allen Hamilton, where he consults on motivations, intentions, and strategies of state-aligned adversaries. And he's here today to talk about his work on PRC scholars and their work on the information war in light of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. I should also add, in comparison to our previous speaker, he is here speaking on his own behalf and not that of Booz Allen Hamilton. Nate, the floor is yours. Oh, oh, oh. There look alike. Thanks. Right. Yes, so. Good afternoon. Uh, over the past two days, we have heard time and again how China represents a strategic challenge for the alliance. Well, a key element of that challenge is information warfare. Last year, NATO described the problem as China's coercive policies and malicious cyber attacks threaten NATO's interests, security, and values. It is fitting then that today we examine China's evolving approach to information warfare and how NATO should adapt. Throughout history, strategists have drawn lessons from past conflicts. By studying other nations' successes and failures, militaries have sought insights that would allow them to refine their strategies and enhance their capabilities. In this tradition, one PLA textbook offers this advice. The bloody lessons left to us by past wars should be learned emphatically. Learning from war, this is our main method. 
While studying other nations' conflicts has a rich history across many of your militaries, China has especially relied on this sort of analysis, having not fought a war since 1979. So, to understand China's perspective on information warfare, we might see it as a series of reactions to other countries' conflicts. So, history lesson. Let's start in, oh, this is my original slide. All right. So let's start in 1991. Iraq's defeat, rapid defeat in the Gulf War shocked China. Iraq's strategy had mirrored China's own, emphasizing mass mobilization and prolonged interior defenses, not cutting edge technology. However, Iraq appeared powerless in the face of digital command and control and smart weapons, Technology and information specifically seem to be deciding factors in modern conflict. Recognizing the PLA's own technical limitations, strategists thus focused on developing asymmetric capabilities. Cyber attacks appeared to be a good option. They could not only cripple connected militaries, but they also could cripple our increasingly connected societies. In fact, Tailored, targeted attacks, some theorized, might coerce or deter an opponent, obviating a need for kinetic conflict. Moving forward, although Kosovo had a mixed outcome in the, in the, although Yugoslavia had a mixed outcome in the Kosovo War, Chinese strategists still saw uh, value in its information counteroffensive. They had disrupted NATO websites and countered its narratives with an independent online outlets. This conflict highlighted that an information offensive and narrative control can challenge adversaries who are technologically superior. Moving on to the early 2000s, likewise, China credited the early successes in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, in part to skillful control of the information environment. The shock and awe strategy had influenced leaders. Embedded media had shaped public opinion, and legal framing had legitimized coalition actions. This validated an emerging concept in PLA strategic circles that information warfare consisted of three warfares, psychological, media, and legal warfare. Pushing forward to the 2010s, information warfare appeared to China to be now an effective strategy for political change. Analysts claimed they had seen the US spread narratives on social media that sparked revolutions in the Middle East, Ukraine, in Hong Kong, but also Russia had successfully manipulated the 2016 US election. Social media had become a key, battle key battleground in the information conflict. In Crimea, Russia also admired Russia's ability to annex Crimea with perceivably limited violence. Allegedly, Russia had blinded Ukrainian military leadership's command and control with cyber attacks. They had pushed pro-independence narratives on a state media with authoritative speakers and convinced Crimeans to support the referendum. Indeed, this annexation thus validated the concept of the three warfares and its ability to conduct regime change. In the late 2010s, analysts revisited the early phases of Iraq and Afghanistan, asking why now at this point, nation building had proved to be so challenging. The information component seemed critical. For example, the previously impressive shock and awe strategy was now sometimes critiqued as indiscriminate violence that had negatively impact local and global perceptions of the United States. Analysts concluded, therefore, that fulfilling initial war objectives must not excessively weaken one's long-term positions in the information environment. So, like previous wars, last year's invasion of Ukraine has been scrutinized in China. In my research, I've identified four trending takeaways in China's public analysis. First, the ability to craft and control narratives is a critical component of modern conflict. From China's perspective, Ukraine's and its allies have maintained support for their cause through the 
effective use of emotionally resonant stories about themselves, like the ghost of Kiev, and disinformation that smears Russia. Second, Russia could not effectively contest the information environment. Why? Because they lacked traditional and social media platforms with global reach. Maintaining the ability to counter uh, an opposing narrative is tantamount in an information war, they say. And this can be threatened by reliance on foreign-controlled media platforms. Third, short-term victories can lead to unexpected long-term consequences in the information environment. Chinese analysts saw that the sanctions imposed on Russia, while presenting a unified approach against aggression, had negative global repercussions. Uh, to you know, link back to the previous presentation by Eduardo, that they had made the West appear callous to the global South. Fourth. There's a need to reassess the role of cyber attacks in modern warfare. Their limited observable impact on the war in Ukraine defined, defied PLA expectations, sparking numerous hypotheses. Perhaps Ukraine had excellent defenses, and perhaps missiles were preferable to cyber attacks, and so forth. So, these insights will likely inform China's information warfare strategy. Therefore, I offer the following takeaways for NATO. One, China will likely craft an aggressively and aggressively advance a compelling narratives well before the possible onset of kinetic activities. It will likely disseminate simple, positive messages about its principles, goals, and vision, while concurrently discrediting its adversaries. Second, to spread narratives effectively, we can expect China to prioritize the establishment of its own traditional and social media platforms with a global reach. This strategy is designed to give China more control over the information environment and to limit silencing. Concurrently, number three, China may adjust its activities to align with larger narratives. It's likely to become more aware of how its actions across domains, space, air, land, sea, cyber, and more, can shape perceptions. Lastly, the PLA is likely to lean towards using cyber operations as a consistent form of coercion against leaders and societies, even during times of peace, referencing the first presentation we heard, subtly influencing perceptions and applying pressure. So, in the face of these probable developments, it is essential for NATO to adapt and prepare. So, in order to do this first, we must develop a unified terminology around information warfare. This will enable us to accurately describe the problem, to communicate amongst ourselves, and to respond in a more precise manner collectively. Secondly, we must learn how to manage the information warfare risk. A key part of this will need to be uh, identifying the uh, vulnerabilities in our national and collective decision-making processes. We must identify the risks and close any unacceptable vulnerabilities. Third, we should be conducting PRC-specific information war games. And when we are conducting war games that do not directly involve China, we may want to consider how China might capitalize on the decisions in those war games to influence the information environment. Fourth, our alliance is fundamentally based upon values. This is in the opening to the Washington Treaty. We must promote these pro-alliance narratives consistently and prior to an escalation of conflict. Uh, this should be done in consistent easily transmissible, organically shareable uh, forms. 
Fifth, it is critical that we raise awareness of PRC influence efforts, both at the leadership level and at a society-wide level. In particular, China's uh, intents on how to use social media to build perceptions about itself and harm its competitors. Finally, it is important that we continue to invest in information warfare research and monitoring. We must have research around understanding the PRC's strategies and tactics and develop a means to rapidly identify threats as they emerge so that they can be quickly responded to. Uh, by having a proactive approach, a unified terminology, uh, and uh, act and intent to uh, manage risk, I believe that we can more effectively manage this growing threat uh, for the Alliance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nate. So we're going to have just a change of activity here because you've been listening very well for the last, yeah. 43 minutes. Um, so on your chairs, you'll find a short questionnaire where we ask you if you had all the resources that you would need, that being financial, human, qualified workforce, political will, government, uh, and no silos and enough public budget, what one action would you recommend to either handle, mitigate, maximize the opportunities of the multipolar interconnected world would you recommend? And who would you recommend it to? So the first one is your recommendation and the second one is to which country, multilateral grouping or otherwise would you recommend it to? We asked this question because you've just heard three brilliant presentations, some food for thought, the opinions of a multilateral organization, opinions from a, um, the global south and the opinions from the US. Plus, add that to your own personal experience and knowledge. You might have some idea what you'd like to propose. Often in government circles, we hear, oh, but we don't have enough money, or oh, we don't have enough qualified people, or oh, it's, it's complicated inside. That is all very true, but that's actually hampering our ability to think out of the box. So I would like you for the next two minutes to write something. And then uh, my colleagues, Jantuan, Christopher, and Alia will come and pick up your pieces of paper, and they will go through them as we enter the next part of this panel, which will be question and answer. So you have two minutes. Does everybody have a pen? <laughs> Ingrid, my colleague Ingrid will come around with writing implements. <laughs> You have one minute left.
15 seconds. I can see some of you writing, but most of you have finished, so I just want to give the last ones a chance to finish their sentences. <coughs> Thank you. So, yes, a gentleman, Alia and Christopher will come and collect your responses and they will do a quick triage outside and we will move on to question and answer. So, as the moderator, I have taken the liberty of writing some questions whilst you think of yours. So, Eduardo, in your paper, uh, which is, by the way, in the conference proceedings, should you wish to see in more detail what he's written and his research, you make a number of criticisms about various EU NATO initiatives. Uh, unfortunately, in this room, there's not a very large Global South uh, representation, so you will have to be our expert on the area. We know that each country has its own traditions and its own processes and its own structures. Could you propose a resource-efficient method to improve coverage of the Global South by NATO EU countries so that we can get to the right people in the right time to discuss timely uh, initiatives such as attribution and also better know these countries so we can tailor our assistance to them in the cyber domain? Yeah, that's a good question and not an easy one. Yeah, yeah I would say there's always a simple answer, often wrong. So uh, a, a, just a single uh, approach would be probably unsuccessful, but as you mentioned, uh, we can start somewhere. And for instance, I, I see, uh, for example, cyber criminal activity being as one easy topic to approach. Uh, definitely something that uh, in the threat uh, matrix analysis from you know, Latin America and African countries, this is a clear threat. So this would be a starting point. Law enforcement agencies cooperating. The fact, for instance, that Brazil recently had, uh, acceded to the Budapest Convention is helpful, of course, uh, but it doesn't stop there. When we think about information operations, for instance, that's not clear-cut as an unlawful domestic uh, activity, international activity. So I think in that sense, uh, we would necessarily have to point to a approach, a case-by-case -case approach. For instance, Brazil doesn't have yet a civilian agency for cybersecurity. We do have a cyber command, but we don't have a signal intelligence agency or a civilian cybersecurity agency. So that's going to be hard for you guys uh, to find the right stakeholder. But that's not the same in every place. Colombia does have one. So at least going for that quick win, you know, mm -hmm. low hanging fruit, and maybe the example. Well, we've been to Colombia, we talked to the people and we dismantled this operation and we're seeing here some influence in elections. And that might give the incentive, the example of something, a successful one. So I would go for there. Okay. I, well, thank you for your answer. I think your proposal of cyber criminal activity as a easy way of getting into the system is a, is a good one. I think most people would not find cyber crime a contentious way or avenue of uh, exploration with another country, whereas we talk about the application of inter -law, in, international law and so, cyberspace, yeah. we quickly get very contentious. That's true. Um, there was a leak at the end of April, reported by Politico about an EU memo where they targeted, or they, they cited four key countries to increase the EU influence around the world. Your country was one of them, Chile was one of them. Does that show to you that the EU are really trying to think out of the box now and reach out to you, well, not to you personally, but the Global South more when they name countries such as Chile, Nigeria, Kazakhstan, does that, does, does that mm -hmm. give you hope that no. we will start getting our act together on our side to have more no, comprehensive uh, in, interaction with you? Yeah. No, definitely. And, and even if you think about the, the, the point that I raised in the paper, is actually looking for help. It's not exactly a criticism in the sense that your guys are not trying. I think it's quite the opposite. Maybe we should try more. And of course, that's, that works in both ways. So uh, in a way, uh, when we think about, for instance, I suggest the, the, uh, the idea of a digital ombudsman. This is the idea where we're going to have more conversations about uncom uncomfortable subjects, which is part of being friends. I'm sure that happens to you as an alliance when you have to discuss issues, it's not always easy. Uh, but we have to create that bridge. I think in a way, yeah, we're being appreciated, uh, 
probably we need to refocus because when we think like the frameworks of the Cold War, it usually it involves an ideological approach, which is no longer the case. We're pretty much all capitalists now, including China. And so, so that's not the issue we have to create and values might be just the bridge to that. Freedom of speech and freedom of the press, for instance, are deeply appreciated in Brazil. So I think that's one way to go. Thank you. Nate, your, all your paper is about China, the PRC's view towards, shall we say, the information war going on to their west. It has been a very sensitive topic, the issue of China, for many years. And I've noticed that this year's Psycon that people have actually started naming it outright and being very um, explicit about that. We here in NATO EU, we cannot really resort to the claims that authoritarian states can make. They have the luxury in many ways of doing that. The question is, how can we pre preemptively amplify good news stories, as you did say, about what we are doing, the values that we hold, and at the same time also raise awareness of what the PRC are doing without resorting to finger pointing and, shall we say, more outrageous claims? Well, um, I think that this conference in and of itself is an example of what NATO can do to broadly raise awareness of these sorts of threats amongst key stakeholders throughout the alliance who can then speak directly to their own countries and to their own spheres of influence. Um, NATO, uh, ha of course, has a strategic communications office uh, capability, and uh, you know they can leverage all the capabilities in their you know within their purview in order to, you know, again, focus on promoting these simple, digestible narratives amongst member states and, uh, you know, uh, about NATO's values, its importance, and doing it in simple, digestible, organic ways. You know, the, you know, the average person, they latch on to stories like the ghost of Kiev. They latch on to uh, the image of, you know, a unified front against authoritarianism. Um, those sorts of simple stories are, I believe, what will be highly resonant and most useful, not just the, you know, the abstract sort of high level uh, policy discussions. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed often that when it comes to information flow and sharing and amplification, it's often the bad news stories which come out. Mm -hmm. From your experience of what you've been seeing about the information sphere inhabited by the PRC, do you see them pushing good news stories in the way that we here in NATO EU can take a lesson from? Um, so a lot of China's influence operations right now to, you know, as reaching back to the uh, presentation by Clint Watts from Microsoft. Uh, it's uh, historically, they were a bit clumsy, but there's a degree of rapid evolution that's undergoing, uh, you know, you know, several, you know, if we think back two decades ago, it was the, the five cent army where China basically paid people minimal amounts to go and just post good things about China online. And it was, you know, very obvious and it was very painful to see, in the sense of like it was very amateurish. But now we're seeing more sophisticated methods like having social media influencers, having probably very soon AI generated content and so forth. Um, so I think what the Alliance needs to be aware of is uh, how it, different ways that it can go about promoting its message, not necessarily always directly the Na you know, NATO speaking to the world, uh, but you know, sponsoring, working with people who, who are considered more of an intermediary for the Alliance. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. It's something that, yes, we might ask Christian about having goodwill ambassadors for NATO in the way that Angelina Jolie is a goodwill ambassador for UNHCR. Yeah. Uh, Christian, you said a number of times in conversations we've, we've had that NATO coordinates member actions. And indeed, this morning we heard that only 5% of what NATO is doing is actually done by themselves. The rest comes from their allies. 
NATO is also a consensus organization that is growing and has grown, and therefore the need to find consensus can be quite frustrating when we want to get things done. Um, there is also always that internal struggle between individual sovereignty and their right to decide their freedom of action versus collective action uh, in the name of the, yeah, the alliance. So have you thought about how we can spearhead action across such different priorities and internal issues to address what we are really currently at a pivotal point of the information war, but also the promotion of our values in cyberspace and shaping it in the way we want it to be? Yeah, um, perhaps now would be the time to say that um, I do not necessarily represent all of the views of, uh, of my organization. <laughs> That's just to make it interesting later on. And I'm going to leave some breadcrumbs behind as well so that, you know, folks can sort of come in. Let me go back to the strategic onion. I think it has, you know, many different layers to it. Indeed, there's the, there's the action, a decision at 31. Uh, hopefully soon to be 32. Uh, but in many ways, a NATO decision, uh, the consensus that you're referring to, um, reflects the will of the Allies. It's, I mean, NATO as an organization does not exist separately. Uh, for all I care, I'm just a boring uh, bureaucrat working at the NATO headquarters at the pleasure of the Allies in this regard. Um, so you really have to sort of look at, in my opinion, action taking place at different levels. And quite often, um, yeah, I'm a bit sort of surprised about the 5%, uh, 5 I thought it was even less. Um, and I think sort of NATO as an organization happens to be in that, in that sort of position where we act as advisors, perhaps sort of, you know, uh, providing these recommendations uh, for allies to be taken, particularly when it comes to, I think, the sort of um, the types of decisions uh, where really the sort of the, the jurisdiction or the sort of the responsibility lies with allies themselves. To be very honest, um, when it comes to some of the information campaigns, and I, and I do agree, I mean, when I also look at the evidence, I mean, the PRC seems to be getting better. I mean, they, they are using AI already, um, and, and in a quite sophisticated way in this regard. I think they don't know the target audiences very well. I mean, the, the whole sort of CCP and the five-year mentality is messing up their things a little bit, but they will improve in this regard. Um, but, but here, I think um, what you see is, uh, is sort of, I think, uh, quite often um, sort of allies themselves taking the, you know, being the sort of the first responder. Um, you know it when you see it, right? Mm. Um, I also do not uh, discount the role of, um, for example, um, coalitions and, and groupings um, of, of allies taking the action. Um, take a look at the ransomware initiative, for example. Mm. Um, so it's not necessarily sort of an, an all sort of um, allies at 31 making decisions all of the time. I think what is important, however, is that we have the same situational awareness and understanding of the issue that we're dealing with. Because there's going to, I mean, once again, the competition mindset is, is different from the peace mindset to me. You, you really have to get the balance right between, uh, once again, sort of uh, protecting the individual and the individual rights and so forth, and at the same time, looking at how to ensure the collective good in this sort of, mm. uh, in this equation. Um, by the way, my personal opinion is that as long as we have independent judiciary, we're okay. In other words, there's a way to adjudicate uh, between these different competing interests inside the nations. There's no NATO court. There's no NATO law. Uh, so that's why I think it, it really starts at home. Um, I mean, it, to me, it starts with Article 3 of the Washington Treaty, the importance of that homework. Of course, sort of much can be done in order to amplify and in order to sort of um, support those that, that need to make these decisions. Um, but what I would hate going forward is that we fail to learn from that lessons of the past. And 5G was an instrumental one to me. Uh, what happened was that we basically left, well, all of the allies alone, right? So everybody was left um, sort of uh, dealing um, with, uh, well, let's, let's sort of put it bluntly, with an issue all alone. Um, so we didn't really sort of, in this regard, uh, manage the systemic risk. Um, all of the decisions had to be at the national level. Now, wouldn't it be good in this scenario if you had an allied decision at 31 that can be used at the national level in order to manage risk? So I think I, I do not want the, the repeat of the 5G. I think the sort of, um, I'm much more worried about the 6G coming our way. But there's going to be a whole lot more. Yes, I mean, in this conference, you've heard about the AI, you've heard about the quantum. Um, that's why I'm sort of focusing so much on that tech competition. Um, and I think 
I mean, the question that you asked from the audience, I mean, what is the sort of the single biggest thing? To me, what I'm, what I'm mostly worried about is fragmentation. Uh, you know, a, a fragmentation whereby, we're, once again, we fail to appreciate, to understand the systemic risk. Um, and by going it alone, um, what you have is a patchwork, and that's not a way to manage that risk. That's not a way to compete, by the way. That's, a, that's the best way to be beaten. Um, so um, NATO can and will and has to have a role in this regard. Um, but I think I mean, when you look at the setup, um, how the sort of the mechanism works, we are but a reflection of allied collective will. Sure, there's a back and forth, um, and I think NATO can and should be used um, also proactively, but to enable once again allies to compete better. Mm. Yes, I think the 5G one is a very salient example. Mm. Um, from my perspective, it was extremely patchwork. I think we just about managed to get there in the end, but for the grace of God. So um, we're, we're still not there. I mean, no? uh, when I look at the statistics, when I look at the numbers, um, I think sort of uh, there are still folks that uh, are willing to accept the risk. Um, but well, I mean, once again, when you when you when you look at the rip and replace, and when you look at the sort of what it takes to move to the next generation, uh, it's not about the cost. I think it's just, um, I think um, um, Paulo Alto was talking about the legacy, you know, the sort of obsolete thinking, you know, the sort of legacy thinking. Mm. I think that's what we need to change once again. It's uh, do not get into the rut of sort of looking at the past. You should sort of be quite honest in your analysis as to sort of what is the art of the possible. Mm. I, I like the CIA triangle, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> or the CIA circle. Yes. With the A on the outside and the yeah. I and the C on the inside. Mm. Okay, one final question before we go to the floor. Um, Eduardo has explained in his uh, paper the various outreach mechanisms that the EU and NATO have. And it seems very much from what you've just been telling me, Christian, that um, NATO has a lot to do inside its house, but it's also quite a large imperative to do something outside of the house. How would you like NATO to engage with Global South, Middle East, Central Asia countries in order that you can collectively shape the future of cyberspace to your values, what our values? Well, just to give you an appreciation, I think sort of we have a fairly extensive global network and we have a, a bit of a bureaucratic language here. We have this sort of document um, that basically codifies our partnership uh, relationship with, uh, with our partner nations. And every single one of them has a chapter on cyber. Every single one of them. Um, another interesting fact, um, when we deal with, um, with our partners, when we deal with, with all issues related to cyber, um, there, there's no magical bullet in this regard. I think you have to appreciate the partner. Um, you know, what is it that they're after? What, is it, what are their needs? What are their requirements? Um, and quite often, it's, a, it's a basically it's a tailored approach um, so that um, the partner gets something out of it. I mean, these can range from knowledge transfer to hardware transfer to, to what have you under the sun. Um, also, scientific research, research, for example, when you know, be that sort of quantum technology or be that AI, um, um, to anything else under the sun. And I think that's the sort of the way to approach it. I mean, listening to Eduardo as well, I think it takes two to tango. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and um, sort of... Uh, People, I mean, we, we all keep using that word cyber, uh, but then, you know, I quite often tell to people, you know, pay very close attention to who's talking to you because they tell you more about themselves than they tell you about cyber, right? Because we, I mean, it, it can be operationalized in many different ways. And that's why sort of what matters here is really sort of the, the actual requirements, the needs that we're sort of looking at. Some of it can be NATO, um, quite a lot of it actually can be um, allies as well because that's where the expertise quite often is, um, particularly when we talk about national networks, when we talk about um, supervisory control and data automation systems and what have you. It's also industry, by the way, uh, that sort of designs and operates these things. So there's no cookie cutter solution, I'm afraid. What it is is sort of trying to understand how best to get to that sort of a win-win relationship. Uh, but I can assure you it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's massively growing uh, in this regard. Well, that's great to hear. And I think it's also quite good that it's not a cookie cutter because every country has their own specificity and needs and nobody wants to feel like they're getting a cookie from a cookie, mm. cookie cutter. <laughs> and the fact that if we can bring in industry and allies, then we can also increase technology transfer, better understanding of how each other's worlds work, better networking. So that sounds great. So moving to the floor. Uh, 
please put your hand up if you have a question. Uh, our volunteers will come round with a microphone. Please state your name and your affiliation. So I can see a lady here with long hair. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Lena Rieke, and I'm a PhD researcher working on spyware from Leiden University. Um, thank you so much to all panelists today. And my question is for Christian. So you spoke of, and correct me if I'm misquoting you here, but you spoke of a tension between privacy and security, or more broadly between human rights um, and security, and how this could make dem democracies less agile um, when it comes to technological competition. But you also mentioned you know, how um, striking the right balance between the two is crucial uh, in democracies if we want to embed our values in technologies before someone else does. Um, so I'm wondering, by whom do you think this balance should be struck? Because to me, it seems that involving civil society, um, the people, is fundamental to democracy. Mm. Um, but when it comes to emerging technologies and their strategic applications, uh, this brings us into the territory of national security, and we kind of find ourselves surrounded by this veil, veil of secrecy. Um, so, you know, and civil society then, or the public might not even be aware that a balance is being struck, and civil society sure might not have the visibility or the power to weigh in on that balance. Mm -hmm. So my question ultimately, uh, I think, is really, at what layer of the onion can we better <laughs> include civil society? No, my onion thing is gonna go wild. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want to collect other questions? No, or? You. You can go first, and I have my eye on two other people. Um, to be very honest, I didn't know that this problem existed until I, I started talking to industry partners, I started talking to intelligence um, and, and law enforcement colleagues, etc. Um, and, and, and what you have is, is perhaps an analyst that is trying to do his or her job, and then you have 40 lawyers that are trying to ensure that you adhere to all of the sort of necessary legal uh, requirements. But by the time you get to an action, the bad guy has already shifted. So it's, um, so it's an almost constant chase uh, in order to ensure that collective good. Now, when it comes to sort of at what layer and what are the sort of the possible solutions, um, I've seen, once again, sort of NATO happens to be almost like a grand central. Things come in and out, and so we, we, we get to be exposed to a lot of things. A different sort of national best practice. Some have, um, uh, for example, put in place uh, ombudsman, uh, you know, going back to that word, um, in order to ensure that the public interest, public good, collective and versus sort of the private, is actually defended well. Um, so that um, if there are these sort of decisions that need to be made in order to stay agile, um, you're doing so cognizantly of the sort of legal ramifications, but also sort of what, you know, what is it that the sort of the day after will look like. Um, to me, once again, as, as long as we, you have the sort of the, the adjudication mechanism um, and you don't make it a blanket agreement, uh, in other words, you err on the side of the, of, the, of the state or the err on the side of the security all of the time, um, I think that's the way to go about. Because there are bound to be some situations in the future, AI has been mentioned, there's, there's other sort of funky stuff coming our way. Um, where if we were to sort of, you know, go for that blanket agreement, it seems to me we would become like uh, kind of the, the camp that we, we sort of do not want to be. I'm talking about the values-based competition where the state interest trumps everything. Oh. That's not the case. Um, I think there needs to be just a sort of a better way in adjudicating between the two so that we can be part of that competition in a, in a good way. Um, these cases do not come too often. I mean, sort of, when I once again look at the evidence on the field, um, we're not talking about something that happens on an hourly basis. We're talking about something that perhaps sort of happens um, depending on the sort of special circumstances once in a while. Um, but sort of losing time and, and, and sort of not being agile and quick in order to move, um, that's why sort of I keep on preaching the proactive thing. I, I, I think we're just not going to make it. Um, it's just that sort of, you know, going back to the values thing, we shouldn't sacrifice our, our, sacrifice our values. We shouldn't um, sort of, you know, throw under the bus the things that are important for us. But we can be a whole lot more smarter about sort of how do we create these balancing mechanisms. At what layer? It needs to be first and foremost at the national level. 
Um, that's, you know, once again, you don't have a, a NATO court of law. What you have is, is national law, national legislation, and anything and everything in order to sort of get to a good balance needs to adhere to the national rules and regulations. That's where it needs to be. I hope that answered your question. Um, we, I saw two questions at the back. So there's one person, one man on the second row and one man on the third row. Yes, you I, there first, and then we'll yep. have answers, and then the next question. Thanks. Hey, uh, Mark Montgomery. I'm from the U.S. Aerospace Solarium Commission. Uh, my question is for Eduardo. On your discussion of values or, and how they contribute, you had economic and then cultural, historic. Shouldn't there be a third one for security? In other words, you value security so you wouldn't, you know, uh, utilize equipment from a company. You know, you could, even the Global South experience there would be like what happened at the African Union headquarters, right, where, mm -hmm. you know, allegedly... Um, the Chinese installed a low-cost system that included a unknown transmission system back to uh, Beijing every uh, few days. You know, shouldn't security be a value that the, that the Global South looks at as they make these decisions? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, yes, I, as, a, as a professional and a former practitioner on cybersecurity, I, I'm fully... Uh, sold on that idea that security is uh, something to be considered. But usually political calculations in the global south tend to point towards you know, the cost and, and just emphasize the idea of you know, security. Oh, this might lead you to, in that particular case, it's, it was obvious that it was happening, something was happening and not supposed to be doing, it's not supposed to be going on. Uh, but that the awareness of our political representatives are, are not, you know, that impressive. Uh, I'm pretty sure here everyone had experience with uh, decision makers and how hard it is to explain technical issues, uh, and I had my share on that. Uh, but I, I think if you phrase it and you, you try to pack it just as a security concern, probably you'll have a hard time, you know, convincing uh, to pay a higher price, which is unfortunate. But we need to, you know, play the hand we have. So that's why I'm, I'm focusing on, you know, cultural, historical ties. Uh, for instance, uh, Brazilian people seem to be much more aware of, you know, the need to have freedom to express themselves through the press and, you know, messaging apps, than concern about, well, to be a target of an APT, for instance. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm heavily uh, 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 skewed toward the, the cultural idea when I'm assessing this comparison. But I agree with you that security to a particular audience, it might be helpful as well, even the global south. Thank you. There was a question from a gentleman. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, Phil Sheriff from Royal Holloway University in London. A question for Eduardo and Christian regarding cyber capacity building. Um, Obviously, you talked about how it needs to be tailored, how there's low-hanging fruit versus longer-term options. Do you have any historical examples where cyber capacity building has been impactful, uh, either in your region or elsewhere, and what lessons can we learn from that going forward? You, you should start first. <laughs> I can support you or criticize you. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, 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 well, I think, thinking about Latin America, I think... Brazil is not a particular great example. Uh, I think we have some good uh, law enforcement relationship uh, through the Interpol and through uh, uh, European uh, Union uh, law enforcement agencies uh, within the, the states. Uh, but I wouldn't qualify that precisely as a capacity building. It's more of an operational routine. Maybe the best example would be Colombia in Latin America. Uh, which is, of course, of high interest for the United States, uh, given the, the, the fight on, you know, guerrillas and, and drug uh, cartels. And Colombia would be a, a good example of, you know, cybersecurity development. You know, some ecosystem, a national one, uh, even reaching to the point where we have, you know, described APTs from Colombia, which is a success case. In a way, it's at least a, an indication of, you know, capabilities, native capabilities. So I would say that. Uh, but if you think about this, and I'm sorry to, to go so deep on it, but if you think about it, it makes sense from the particular context of Colombia that reach out to the U.S. that had a, a deep issue, you know, security issue that was able to mobilize, you know, 
the U.S. attention as well as resources and, you know, domestic uh, uh, convergence on the subject. I don't think you're going to find that in every Latin American country, for instance. So that's, that's a pity. Yeah, um, our experiences, I, I tell you sort of, we started off very enthusiastically, um, sort of, um, sort of expecting that rising tide lifts all of the boats, um, all good things to everybody. But we quite soon noticed that, um, well, it, it sounds a bit sort of corny, but I have to go back to that Taylor thing. Um, there's another aspect to it, um, and that's about sort of, no longer about the strategic canyon, it's about sort of how to fish, right? So instead of sort of giving the fish, I think what we learned it is much more useful, useful sort of to teach, to teach folks how to fish, um, and and that has been I think sort of a much more successful business model, um, whereby um, a, a knowledge is transferred, an understanding yeah. is transferred, sort of that instead of sort of having to repeat the same thing all over again, um, you you build the internal capacity. Uh, over time to deliver and handle things um, internally uh, on on your own. Um, now, when it comes to these different stories that we have, these range from um, sort of hands-on keyboard training, hand, you know, sort of an education at the senior level, etc. Um, and I think quite often it, it really depends what what people make out of it. Um, but I think sort of one of the most tough ones for us has been um, a hardware transfer. I mean, technology, going back to Palo Alto here as well, I mean, it, it, it sort of stuff, you know, it, it gets old really fast. So, so that's why, to me, instead of looking at the, the technology per se, it's, it's, and then I'm going back to you, I mean, it's, it's basically about sort of, you know, you know, helping people how to sort of comprehend the issue mm -hmm. and how to manage it, how to actually think a bit differently. I think the return on investment on this one has been much, much, much greater for us, but also for those that have been the, sort of the beneficiaries of that capacity building. Um, yeah, and, 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 and stuff is moving fast. So once again, when, when we listen, when we look at sort of what's coming our way, it keeps on changing. You know, sort of perhaps it might have been a, a security operations center 10 years ago. Now it might be actually sort of how to manage the risk in, in a supply chain. So um, it, it continues to change, but I think the sort of the, the best cases that we have so far are the ones where you know you you, you basically you change the mindset. Uh, there's a sort of a lasting change in this regard. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> Mark is very inquisitive too. Yeah, uh, Mark again. Hey, the, uh, Nate, for you, um, <laughs> in your slides you, you had something uh, that, that looked a little concerning. You said be coer have coercive, it looked like coercive persistent cyber warfare uh, is you know, one of your final recommendations there. Did you mean that in peacetime or only after an Article 5 event? And if you meant it in peacetime, how does that work with how NATO actually does operations? So... China has, so we, we are all deeply familiar with how Russia uses cyber attacks uh, below what might be considered the threshold of war. And as those have been conducted against NATO countries for, you know, well over the past decade plus, and, you know, that still hasn't evoked an Article 5 uh, situation. You know, we've had destruction of private sector uh, organizations. You know, we've had media targets like TV5 Monde in France. We've seen uh, intrusions and disruptions at uh, transportation facilities. Uh, and so, so far, NATO has shown that, no, this does not escalate to an Article 5 situation. Uh, and uh, I believe it would be a reasonable assumption by the Chinese to think that why would the same standard not apply to them, that they could periodically get away with, you know, flashy disruptions, flashy uh, events that don't necessarily have protracted long-term harm, that don't have uh, loss of life, but they have an information effect. It's not about the size of the explosion, it's the size of the boom and whether or not people hear it. <laughs> uh, so 
And in information warfare, you know, the cyber attacks aren't being used in order to fundamentally undermine someone's national capabilities. They're trying to undermine, you know, their national uh, consciousness. Thank you. If there are no more questions. Yes, Ingrid. Yes, Ingrid. <laughs> I'm going to let my inner linguist out a little bit. I'm curious, because um, you all sort of touched upon this bit of communication both between allies uh, with the Global South, how NATO, AEU can communicate uh, to the Global South, and obviously the Global South isn't one unit that would understand communication the same way. And Nate, one of your recommendations is uh, establishing some sort of common vocabulary. Now, one of my great pet peeves in life, and I've ranted to several of you about this over the last many years, is the whole the words we choose to use, they do matter, and where we put cyber and mm -hmm. how we use it, and buzzwords, and it's a, it's a significant challenge. It's a challenge domestically, it's a challenge within, uh, within organizations, within regions, and of course globally. Um, so I wanted to give you each a, and well, personally, I think the Tallinn Manual is one of the best, uh, best ways we can mitigate the effect of not speaking the same language, so everyone pick up a coffee and, and, and rely on that. Um, but I wanted to give you each a chance, if, you, if you're willing, to reflect briefly on how you imagine how on earth we could get to some sort of common language, common understanding of these terms that we throw out so much. And I would accept the simple answer, no. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. We'll start with you, Nate. There were 15 standards. Let's propose a new one. It will unify all the standards. Now there are 16 standards. Uh, so it's a goal worth pursuing, and I wish I had a solution for how we were going to do it. I mean, even on a, not even a NATO level, but on a national level, on an industry level, there are still challenges about using what should be rather simple terms like cyber attack. Mm -hmm. A port scan in my book is not a cyber attack. <laughs> a phishing attack is not a fitness cyber attack. So we are, we're still grappling with basic terms even in a field that we've done substantial research in for decades and we haven't come to a conclusion about how to use terms in a precise and mutually intelligible way. So. Uh, and it hampers our industry quite fr and our field, quite frankly. And I hope that the information operations, information warfare uh, community, as you know, as they begin to develop, they try to clamp down those problems early, before we have 16, 17 <laughs> standards. Article 92, Colin 2.0, is my attack. Nice. <laughs> Christian. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, I just, uh, <laughs> that would be <laughs> naughty of me. <laughs> like, there's this famous saying at NATO, like, if you absolutely positively want to stop something, start with the definition. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's going to take us until the cows come home. Um, so, like, it's just sort of a, uh, it, it sounds like an anecdote, but it isn't. I mean, um, so when we started with defining what is cyber defense, um, I think it took us 12 years. So meanwhile, like life moves on, right? So don't let perfect be the enemy of the good, is my message. Um, there's messaging and then there's messaging, because you want to be very precise when it comes to political signaling. And uh, let me go back to the sort of um, cyber attack versus malicious cyber activity. There are international humanitarian law implications to it. So when you're doing political signaling uh, to your competitor, um, and, and, and adversary, you want to be very, very clear in this regard. And, and I can assure you, it goes through many, many, many drafting sessions so as to sort of uh, avoid that sort of misunderstanding. I think it's a bit of a different case when you're talking, when we're talking about information warfare and then sort of the other, other aspects where you're either trying to communicate a message to a greater public or trying to sort of raise awareness, etc. Um, and I think there, sort of, um, NATO can play its part, but I can also sort of see how different people. Um, yeah, and sort of, you know, at, also at different levels, use different language. So when it comes to the, the diplomatic language and diplomatic messaging, it's quite different, once again, from perhaps somebody that is uh, communicating with a technical audience, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, 
but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't get to that. I, I think the answer actually is uh, not necessarily the sort of the precise language as such, as the effect. What is it that you're trying to get to? Um, and then sort of, I, I don't really care, you know, what color the cat, as long as it catches the mice, right? No <laughs> pun intended. So, so, so that's that, that's the effect part that I'm much more interested in, rather than the sort of the specific terminology and whether we have agreed to it. Thank you. Um, Eduardo, quickly? Yeah, I think the... <laughs> quickly, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I think the example of the Budapest Convention is a good example. Yeah, and I think Christian nailed it. In the, thing, in the sense that since you're dealing with, uh, you know, law and constitutional assurance and due process, so you need to have a precise definition. So mm -hmm. you're only going to adhere at that if you're really, really sure of what you're doing. So that, but that's one perspective. If you're going to talk about, for instance, formation warfare, I think you can have, you know, broader language. The objective here might be just, you know, to make people aware. So I think the audience determines how the approach goes. But, you know, to have a, a conversation that's straightforward and where you, both of people agree on it, I don't think that's gonna happen, you know, most of the times. So we should accept it as part of it, so. Yeah, polite. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you all for filling out the questionnaire. I have a few in front of me which I'll quickly read out before we sum up. We have someone who said that we should come to a shared agreement regarding regulating and peaceful use of EDTs, particularly AI. UN, this is you. Um, I have to say I have sat through some uh, first committee meetings on uh, trying to think about whether we ought to consider regulating autonomous weapon systems. So is the will has been put on the table. We spent quite some time trying to decide how many days we would meet next year. That's not the most progressive, but again, I think if we had some will, we could move forwards on that, but it's also hostage to fortunes of other nations and their own interests. We have a couple regarding increasing uh, individual security to in increase uh, collective security and to enhance trust in information sharing and interoperability, which was indeed something that was cited when we had our first Mentimeter. I uh, have a couple of people asking for the creation of a multilateral, multi-stakeholder forum of like-minded nations, including industry, citizens, civil society, to address interconnected issues, such as AI, which is a great idea. This person has written, the difficulty is more political than resources, which is good to know. Uh, somebody else has suggested we build a team to handle and mitigate opportunities, uh, making sure that every country and nation has a seat at the table of this discussion. And then finally, we have someone saying we should just win the ongoing competition <laughs> so we can shape cognitive aspects of the cyber domain with the promotion of rules-based world order messaging. That is very good. That's ambitious ambition for us all. So we have two minutes left. I would just like to move to the last Mentimeter, just so you can help me sum up. Uh, so Jantuan is just going to change the slide, if you can. If you could uh, let uh, Jantuan take control of the slides. No, that's the first set of slides. The fourth? No, we need to go to the... F yes, this is the one. If you wouldn't mind scanning that or entering the code at menti.com, we can have a quick sum up and compare to the top three of what you suggested at the beginning, 90, well, 88 minutes ago. <laughs> have we got anything, gentlemen, yet? No, okay. Yep. Oh, yes, okay, we already have one suggestion. You wouldn't mind letting gentlemen take the control. It says win. <laughs> um, if the IGB team could just let Jantawan take control. No, yeah, there we go. Oh, the onion has, get, has got a lot of support. <laughs> Unintended consequences. <laughs> Ten answers. You should be careful because they're going to say that NATO is endorsing the use of TOR, you know, <laughs> the onion approach. <laughs> Uh, who wrote Naughty Christian? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can get to 40 and then we'll close. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I think the onion's going to get its own meme by the end of this conference. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> okay, I'll let you carry on while I, I close up. Um, so thank you very much for coming today. We have learned that uh, we need to do a lot of internal capacity building and offer tailored assistance and engagement to global south countries. We've talked about mapping our own vulnerabilities and playing those out so we can learn better what we can do if it actually comes to pass. And we've also talked about learning from previous experiences to coordinate and enhance collective action. This is the end of our panel, peering past NATO's precincts. I'd like to thank our speakers once again, Nate Beach Westmoreland, Christian Eric Lifthander, and Eduardo Exiki. Thank you very much. <laughs>